Approaching the release of Fallout 4, I kept myself busy with Fallout 4 projects. What better way to celebrate the release of such a fantastic game by creating our own custom controller and consoles? Well, I'm going to show you everything you need to know to create your own custom controller in this video. This controller is a part of a system that I created for a friend of mine. Fallout 4 themed, of course. I wanted to show you this controller in the context with the actual console itself so you can actually see why it looks the way it does. Now you don't have to make your controller look exactly like this. That's not the point of this video. The point of the video is to show you everything that you need to know to be able to create your own custom controller. If you want to do Fallout but you don't want to do the, this kind of weathered look, you know, you want to do something like maybe you want to create your own version of the official Fallout 4 controller. Using all three of my controller videos, you will be able to find techniques that will teach you everything you need to know to create your own custom controller. Welcome to my tutorial. Feel free to navigate the tutorial at any point in time during the video using the menu. Skip around, see what you want to see, do what you want to do. As long as you do follow all the steps in order, you should be able to make your very own special controller. To complete this project, you're going to need to pick up whatever paint you would like to use for your theme. You're also going to need to make sure that you have a T8 security Torx screwdriver as well as a T10 Torx screwdriver. It does not need to be a security screwdriver. You'll need three 20 grit sandpaper, two 20 grit sandpaper, and 400 grit sandpaper if you choose to do the weathering technique that I will show you in this video. We could find many, many items that will help us customize our controller on eBay. It is a great place to go and look and start imagining what it is you want. The best place to start is by checking out a home button. There are custom home buttons available. It's possible that you can even get one of these guys to make your own custom design home button as long as you provide whatever picture you want. I could not find a Fallout custom button and I wasn't going to pay the extra money for that. But I did actually end up getting some silver ABXY buttons and the uh, menu button and the go back button or whatever. I still think of them as start and select buttons, but I know you know what buttons I'm talking about. You can also find bullet buttons, which would have looked really cool on this project, but those are a little bit more expensive than what I wanted to pay for. And not all of us have a lot of money to spend on these kinds of projects, so keeping it thrifty is something we may want to consider. We'll start off taking apart the controller by flipping it over and looking at the handle parts of the controller, you will see that there is a seam. On the seam on the outside edge, you will grab a hold of it and pull it towards you. It'll make a popping sound. Do not worry, you're not breaking anything. You are simply freeing this cover. You'll pull it towards you and then work your fingers down towards the base or the end of the controller. It will pop off. It won't break anything. Just be careful. Don't break your fingernails doing this. You could use a small screwdriver to assist you if you'd like. Once we've got that pulled apart, we're going to go ahead and remove the battery cover. And underneath of the battery cover, there is a screw under the sticker. There's a sticker inside there. This is how Microsoft knows if you voided the warranty on the controller if you opened it up. So take that into consideration. You are voiding your warranty on this. Hopefully you were well aware that that was going to happen. Remove the center screw first. And then there are four screws, two at the top and two at the bottom. Inside the controller, there are also five screws, three on the bottom PCB board and one next to each rumbler. You will use your T10 Torx screwdriver to pull these screws out of place. After that is done, you can then remove your buttons by pulling off the button pad first and then basically just carefully dumping your buttons out onto your table. Make sure that they don't bounce off the table. If you drop one, what are you doing? Pay attention to what you're doing. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Things happen.
To remove the D-pad, you will grab the silver ring that holds it in place from the bottom and pull it upward. Here is everybody's least favorite part. Everyone hates sanding. You don't have to sand if you use something like Plasti-Dip. Um, they have a spray. It's like a, a spray rubber. It gives it a nice cool texture. I wouldn't suggest using that um, for a weathering kind of project like this one is, but if you want to avoid having to sand, there's your answer. Plasti-Dip spray rubber, I guess. I want It's like paint, but it's not paint. So I'm not going to call it paint because that would be misleading. I used the 320 grit sandpaper to sand this down. Very lightly, just make it look matte. That's all you've got to do. Be careful around your edges. You don't want to deform your controller plastic. Just make it matte. And then once you've completed sanding the faceplate and the bottom, you can move on to your buttons. I lay the sandpaper down and then move the buttons in a circular fashion until it is nice and scuffed up. That is, if you do in fact plan on painting your buttons. Again though, if it is something that you want to do, make sure that you cover those buttons with painter's tape around the edges. Really, a very small part of the button actually shows through on the top. So, as long as you get the top area painted, you're going to be fine. It's going to look fine. It's going to look great. Everybody's favorite part, painting. Here we go. You want to start off by using a primer. Always use a primer. It is absolutely necessary. If you don't use a primer, your paint will thin out around the edges, and it's going to look like crap. So you don't want that. I use the universal bonding primer. It drives very quickly, 15 minutes or less. Actually, a lot less. I mean, it almost dries instantly. Not exactly instantly, but almost instantly. You only really need to lightly dust what you're going to paint. The faceplate, I painted it with green and black. And I did that all over it because I wasn't quite sure where I was going to put the stencil that I was going to create. And I wasn't even sure what stencil I was going to use. Eventually I decided to go ahead with a Vault-Tec logo. First I hit it with a cheap black paint. Then I hit it with, with sage green Rust-Oleum American Accents paint, which is very thick. So I didn't really do very much, just one solid coat on that to kind of marbleize it. After you've let that dry for a little bit, you can then start with your first coat of paint. I chose a flat brown paint because this is going to act as our rust. I'm going to put a different color over the very top of it, and then I'm going to sand that down, revealing this rust color underneath. I did two coats of this brown paint, letting it dry for about 15 minutes between each coat, and then after the second coat, I let it dry for five hours. I created the stencil by using blue painter's tape that I had stuck down on a heavy plastic and then putting a printed out picture of the logo over it, securing that down with blue painter's tape and then cutting it out. This is a very basic technique, something that you should have learned in art class, provided that you had an awesome art teacher. I did, Mrs. Anderson. If you're out there, if you're still alive, 
You taught me great things. She's not watching this video. She's probably dead. Maybe, maybe I should go to school about love When it comes to getting chummy I'll admit I'm quite a dummy Worry, 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 woe is me I found out that I'm the worrying kind I go worrying right along Life is fine, but with the worry in mind So many things can go wrong Worry, 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 should I hold her so tight? Worry, 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 am I kissing her right? She said, Joe, it's you, I'll marry. I'm not Joe, my name is Harry. Worry, 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 woe is me. The dustiest, the winds are the gustiest. The Once I had this cut out, I went ahead and applied this to the faceplate, and then I hit it with the brown, making sure to get one really good solid coat down, because this already has technically one coat of paint, and I don't like to use more than about three coats of paint whenever I'm painting anything. And then after that had dried for about six hours, because you gotta let it set, you don't want the two paints to mix. I hit it with a super solid final coat, one coat of the hammered textured paint by Rust-Oleum. When applying this, you want to get down to about three and a half, four inches away from the project and kind of lay it on thick. You don't want it so thick that it starts dripping, but when you lay it on there kind of thick, you'll see the paint kind of have like a swirly texture to it. And that means that it is activating and that the pits are going to start showing up and it's going to start looking like metal the longer it sits. Once it's dried completely after 24 hours, it's going to look really, really good. You'll see pits and all kinds of stuff just kind of poking through. It looks really, really cool. Directly after painting that final coat, I went ahead and removed my stencil because if you let our stencil sit on there after it dries completely and you go to pull it, you risk peeling your paint off. So make sure to pull your stencil off directly after you've applied your final coat. Now it's time to weather this thing. It's sat for 24 hours. Sometimes you might need to, if you're using this same kind of paint, you might want to let it sit for a little bit longer than 24 hours, maybe up to 48 hours, because the thicker you put it on there, the longer it takes it to dry. And this, I noticed during the course of the project, there were a couple times after I'd let it sit for 24 hours, um, that I was getting like a rolling from the paint rather than dust. So if you go and you do a weather technique like I'm doing on this one and it's, the paint is rolling off and you can feel big smudgy pieces and stuff, you need to stop and let it dry for longer because it needs to dust off of it. It shouldn't be coming off in big clumps. I used various grit sandpaper to get various weathered looks. So I used the 220 grit sandpaper for the big scuffs and scratches. The 320 grit sandpaper to kind of get the wider, more broad, rusty look. And then I used 400 grit sandpaper to kind of elaborate on all of those edges and also to give that metal look a little bit more wear to it. After I finished that, then I hit it with the multi-textured paint, just lightly dusting it here and there, adding a different tone of rust to it. Keeps it an inconsistent kind of look. To illustrate his last remark, Jonah in the whale, Noah in the ark. Now it's time to clear coat. It is super important that you apply a clear coat to your final project because if you don't, all of the work that you're doing is going to get smudged away by the oils in your hands. So do not skip this part. I know it's another 24 hours that you have to wait until it's cured, but it's going to be worth it in the end because there's nothing worse than waiting for hours on a project 
that looks fantastic and then all of it get turned to crap because you didn't take the time to protect it. You want to do this in three solid coats, allowing 15 minutes between each coat. Make sure to get it from all angles, moving your pieces around just like you would when you were painting it. While doing this in a series of three, you're creating a nice, solid, protective barrier from anything. Scratches, scuffs, oily, sweaty, nasty, dirty hands, anything that you can really think of. Don't be throwing it at the wall or anything. Don't be, don't be doing that. I can't guarantee that you're not going to knock off some paint if you do something extremely hostile. But it's going to look good. I guarantee it. Things are going to start popping through. The colors are going to look more vibrant. Everything is going to look fantastic when you use a clear coat. Now that our clear coat has dried for 24 hours, we're going to go ahead and reassemble our controller. We're going to start by laying the controller face down, putting our buttons back into place. Now it's very easy to know which button goes where because there are special grooves for each specific button and they will fit only in their actual slots so you can't mess this part up. Really easy. After we get all of our buttons into place, we're going to go ahead and place our button pad down. And then we're going to close this guy up, reapply our screws, flip it over, make sure to uh, get that silver piece back into place that holds your D-pad where it's supposed to go. There's no button pad for that. That's awesome, right? I, I actually just realized that during this project. One less thing you have to worry about, that's always nice. Make sure that when you're putting the trigger button back into place that you have the rumblers inside. They actually connect with a magnet to the trigger buttons. Very easy to put those back into place. And then just make sure that you got the screws in there all the way so that way when you close this guy up it's not rubbing up against the shell or anything like that. Once the buttons are back into place, you will lay it face first into the face plate. Go ahead and turn it over. Make sure your buttons are all working, moving freely. They're not getting stuck or anything like that. Once you've assured that is the case, you can flip it back over. Go ahead and place the back end of the controller back into place. Make sure that the two metal slots that are sticking up off of the PCB board are sticking up through into their actual slots that go inside where the battery pack is. Go ahead and push the shell down and then... While pushing down, pull in on your left and right triggers, and it will pop back into place. It's really super easy. Now that that's back into position, we're going to go ahead and screw in our center screw first. Flip it over again real quick, reassuring that our buttons are still moving freely. Once you've made sure that they do, flip it back over and apply your last four screws back into place. This project, while it takes a lot of time to wait for everything to dry, um, you don't have to do this the way I did it. I highly recommend that you check out my other controller tutorial videos. I have two more, another Xbox One controller video and a PlayStation 4 controller video. Both of these videos will show you techniques that you can use on whichever controller you might be using.
Here is our final project. Once it is finished, it is looking glorious. It is all back together. And I know that the guy who owns this is absolutely ready to fall into the wasteland. I am too, but I have to wait a little bit. I'm so sad. I haven't got the game yet. Can you believe it? I feel like I'm living under a rock. I've just been so busy creating this video for you and the custom console video to follow this video. The Xbox One Fallout 4 custom console do-it-yourself tutorial will be available on my channel. Make sure to subscribe so you know when that is available. Check it out. Check out my other videos. I do gaming videos, do-it-yourself tutorials, beta footage, whatever you like to see. I'm sure there's something there. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like. Let me know what you think by leaving a comment. Thank you all so much for checking out this video, guys. I am ready to go play some Fallout 4, so I will see you in the next video.